Caravella Coffee Talks are back, a space created to speak with thought leaders, to exchange knowledge and share perspectives. In these talks, the Relationship Building Team invites you to attend sessions with female leaders in the industry. We will hear about their aha moments, life lessons, breakthroughs, and how we can make coffee better together. Over the years, we have seen how the representation of women in the industry has gained traction and has flourished. Join us for some inspiration. Hello, welcome. My name is Marisabel, Marketing Manager at Carabella. Hi, I'm Ana Sofia, Relationship Builder at Carabella. We are so excited. This is our ninth episode of Carabella Coffee Talks, Women Make Coffee Better. It has been a wonderful experience speaking with brilliant coffee professionals worldwide. This time is no different. In this episode, we are honored to feature Phyllis Johnson. She's the co-founder of Feedy Imports and board member and director at the Coffee Coalition for Right Racial Equity in the United States. Phyllis is also the author of The Truth, Black Brazilians in Coffee. Yes, and in this episode, we speak about women empowerment and the participation of marginalized communities, how the industry misses a lot of opportunities when there isn't a representation of the Black community or underrepresented coffee professionals. She also shared her, her stories and great insights into how there is still hope in coffee, and it is within us to create a better industry, one that we're proud of. Let's hear from Phyllis. Well, welcome everyone. Today we have another coffee talk and we have the pleasure and the honor of having Phyllis Johnson. Welcome joining us today uh, to this coffee talk to share a bit about her journey in coffee, her current role, and also uh, the amazing thing that she's doing to make this industry better um, with her projects and the people she works with. Um, so welcome Phyllis, thank you for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, Sophia. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm honored that uh, you invited me to spend this time with you. And I'm uh, so pleased to um, have been invited to be a part of Caravella's um, speaker uh, guest list. Um, I think what you're doing as a company and what you're doing um, socially is so important in coffee and we need more companies like yours. We need more individuals who care more about coffee than just the trade. So thank you for having me. No, thank you. Thank you. This is a collective effort. And I think um, there are, like Caravella, there are many people in the industry doing amazing things to uh, contribute. So this is not just a company's role, right? It's everyone that is included and that loves coffee in a way um, to kind of make the change and be the change. So thank you for, for your words. Um, maybe we can start and with a small introduction about, about you, uh, your background and, and maybe how your coffee journey has started. Um, I've been in coffee for a couple of decades and Um, it's been an incredible journey. For me, I started out uh, in the green coffee trade, knowing nothing about coffee. I think it was uh, 1999, PD Imports was started. My husband, Patrick, and I um, just decided that, you know, it was going to be coffee. And it was my suggestion to him. Uh, we always knew we wanted to be entrepreneurs and start our own company. Um, and it was coffee. Um, I traveled a, a lot around um, different places and saw what was going on with coffee, um, but more so an opportunity presented itself to look at coffees from East Africa. So that was the part that was really intriguing to me, um, to be able to make the connection and the stories and understand what was going on with an agricultural product. Um, In Africa, I mean, I, I was fascinated with Africa. I was fascinated with learning about the continent. And I grew up on a farm in Arkansas. So, you know, after completing my um, degree at the University of Arkansas, there were still just a lot of questions about life, you know, and I think that that's how we are. And coffee has enabled me to understand life a little bit better. I, I'm not going to say I 
I've figured it out, but it, it's put me on a journey. So the opportunity to travel to many different countries, probably over 20 different countries, speaking on the value of em, uh, empowering women and giving women opportunity, um, that has enriched my life so much. But at the same time, it's given me a chance to look back at my life and growing up and understand that I too had a powerful woman in my life, and that was my mother. Um, and I got a chance to watch her go through her life in a way that um, that uplifted others as well as herself and our family. So my journey in coffee has been, it's been interesting. It's been a nice long journey. Uh, it feels long when you're a business owner, it's a long journey. Um, I've enjoyed meeting so many incredible people though. Um, when I think about what I really enjoy about coffee, it's the people, it's the product. Um, there's just so much there. I'm sure you can relate to that as well. I, I especially relate to the side of, of the people, right? Because uh, that is what, this is the people is the backbone of our industry and behind the people we have their culture. Mm. Um, so once, you know, beyond looking beyond the cup of coffee, uh, we need to look at who is growing it, uh, who is involved. There are so many hands um, and there's a lot that we can do. And in this case, um, you are, you have since the beginning, right? Uh, that idea and that mission of like kind of involving women empowerment. And that goes to show it as well um, from my perspective, how uh, when we are empowered women, we can make other women uh, not more powerful, but empower them uh, to empower others. Um, mm -hmm. Even when we're not thinking about, like, we are focusing on women empowerment, but just on a daily basis, we are doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like, it's like a communal way of thinking, I find. And it's not to just categorize all women are like this and all men are like that. I don't necessarily believe that. But um, what I found with the women that I've had the chance to work with is there's an innate communal way of thinking, you know, yes. it's about us, you know, I don't know, you know, where it starts, when it starts, but that component of nurturing is so vital. And I think that we see that as being weak we see that as not being a tool for advancement, but it's so vital. You know, it, it's the source of all of our strength. When you think about it, we all must be nurtured into the people we are. And we don't value that as much as we should in the business world. So, yeah, I, I can really relate to, you know, the women's empowerment. Yeah, and it goes, uh, I, I highly agree, it goes beyond just say empower women, empower women, you know. Yeah. Um, there are so many aspects and factors uh, and ways that you can empower women and sometimes it's just words of encouragement. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's a great return on investment. When I had the, great, the opportunity to work with the UN International Trade Center, in the International Women's Coffee Alliance, we didn't have a ton of money for investments on the ground. A lot of my work was donated. And, wow. but the return on investment, it's still giving dividends. It's still giving value. It's, it's, just, it's just so much of a great investment. I, I don't understand why we, not, why we don't invest more. So, um, you know, in this part of working with women, like uh, realizing that you wanted to work with coffee and study in, in Africa, what has been that pivotal moment or turning point that uh, really changed maybe uh, your focus on in coffee or definitely helped you uh, to, to say, this is what I want to, to work on and, and invest yeah. my, my time? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think, to be honest, I think I've always been an, I can't remember when I wasn't an advocate for women. I, okay. I just can't. I, and not just women, but I always wanted to say, 
don't judge me because, you know, I might be short in statue, I might be woman, I might have a softer voice, I might not be as assertive, um, but I'm still smart, I'm still capable. And I think we, as all humans, want that right? Yeah. But women generally are categorized to believe that, you know, this is your role. And it would always infuriate me when I would see women just gravitate to certain roles traditionally, as if we didn't have the ability to think and act and do the same things as, as men. And so I, I brought up my mother because I saw her do some really bold things that the men would not do. And it advanced herself and her family and ultimately advanced the community. The community started to say, oh, wow, she's making those decisions as a farmer. Maybe we should make those decisions. But at first she was ridiculed for making those decisions. So I think women have this, because they are oftentimes overlooked, and not thought to have the answers, they get this opportunity and this space to kind of sit back and watch. And they're not judged or pushed to the front all the time to say, you know, give us the answer, show us the way. So they kind of have a different angle and they can look at life in a different way and be more inclusive. Because when you bring a woman to the table, oftentimes they're going to say, who else isn't here? Well, what about this person? Well, what about that are we taking care of the children? You know, so those are some elements that women bring to the table innately just by being there. And, and it's not to say that all women feel the same way. I've always felt a sense of duty. Um, I'm the youngest child of eight children. And so my pivotal moment was probably just seeing life play out continuously in the way that it had all my life. So it's, it's hard to say there was just this light bulb, like, oh, I should focus on women. Yeah. It was just like, there's no other way. You yourself are a woman. You can yeah. trust yourself. You know what is in you. You know the work ethic that is in you. And then when I reached out to other women, um, a lot of the East African women who were just starting their businesses, who were just starting the washing station or starting to export coffee, they were incredibly reliable. And the things they would do to support any sort of initiative that we had started to work on was just beyond my imagination. So I knew that because they had been lacking opportunity, they were so willing to do what it takes to get the job done. And that's what you find with individuals who have not had an opportunity. So um, there wasn't a pivotal moment. It was, it's just always been that way. And I know that women in coffee has kind of been this fashionable thing that's kind of, you know, not everybody was talking about it because I was in those rooms when people didn't want to hear about it. I was talking about it when people didn't want, I have photos of speaking oh, yeah. at the Specialty Coffee Association conference about women in coffee. And there were two people in a room that was meant for 50. And my husband was taking a picture of the audience and there were two people and both of those two people were my friends. People did not want to hear this. I, no. I kind of try to put myself in that time. In that time, and I bet it was very, very uncomfortable. Oh yeah. It was, it was uncomfortable, but you know, for some people it's okay. It's okay if people came to the discussion later, right? When it became more comfortable because we need those people as well. Yeah. You know, you could say, well, why weren't you here when, you know, people didn't want to hear the message. Um, I was watching a video of um, recording in the, Uganda. And there was a man on the local television station, and he was talking about women's empowerment and women's empowerment in coffee. And he was saying to the national Ugandan audience, I think it was last year or year before last, he was saying to Uganda, 
the same things that women said softly to me in meetings almost 15, 20 years ago. And I, and when that happens, you're just like, okay, (laughs) it was worth it. It was worth it. The little quiet voices of the women in the room in the first Women in Coffee Leadership Development Program uh, sponsored by the International Women's Coffee Alliance and the International Trade Center. Those little voices are now words that are coming from men. And that's what you want. I mean, you can't get too upset that um, everybody is not at the table when you're at the table wanting something or feeling the need for something because your desire to fight for something comes from your own personal experiences and your own bravery and how you feel protected or in in speaking out. And I have to say that I've been truly blessed to feel protected. And I wouldn't say to feel protected, but to feel that the need to speak out outweighs my need to stay silent, right? Yeah, and it's kind of, uh, I, I translate that into just this driving force that tells you uh, this is the right thing to do. It's just the right time to, to say it. And even if that means that just two people are going to listen. Right, right. You, it doesn't matter wh- whether or not people listen. It's on you to say it. And it's on them to listen if they so choose. But the time to do something isn't necessarily when it's acceptable. And the one thing about when I hear folks talk about, you know, social causes and coffee and, you know, whether it's, you know, gender equity, racial equity, whatever the, you know, cause is, they'll often say, well, what's the economic uh, value in that? Or is it a business case? What's the business case for that? You know, If the market had never said there's value in empowering women in coffee, it still needed to happen. Yeah. It needed to happen. And that's that's what I've always said, that if 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 I never saw one bean of coffee based on my view of of gender equity, that's okay. Because it just is something that needs to happen regardless whether or not a market is there to tell you, oh, well, that's or I should say reward you for that work. Because if you're waiting for the market reward, then you that means that you're probably doing some things that you should not be doing and you're not making the best decisions. So. I think those of us in the middle market and those of us in business in general, we have to make those decisions. And as smaller uh, companies, you can make those decisions. You really can. And that's the fun part about it. Um, you can make decisions that make a difference. So, yeah, I, I, I resonate with what you, you say. And I think it's our, our duty, our duty and our responsibility to to really pay attention, look, kind of analyze and and see where we are going when we say uh, let's empower women or let's empower farmer uh, because there is an economic impact, of course, uh, but how do we share this story? Are we really Mm -hmm. sharing it the proper way? Will we respect um, their identity, their culture, um, their work? But also, how is this respectful as well for the one who is going to consume this coffee? It, it goes both ways. Um, so I think that really matters. And, mm-hmm. and, it, and it's important in the work we do, not only to promote or to uplift women, but any, any farmer in the, coffee, in the coffee industry. Yes, yes. It does, me, it does my heart a lot of good to hear uh, these words coming from you as the next generation, because it's so sound and clear as far as what should happen. Um, yes, how farmers are are portrayed. Um, yeah, 
it has an impact on the lives of the people who are consuming the coffee as well. Because if we are portraying farmers in a way that's not uplifting and empowering and giving, we don't have to give them dignity. They, yeah. <laughs> they have more dignity than we can imagine. Oh, this is this is so good, you know, because I had this conversation with um, just to share a personal experience here. I had this conversation with my father, who also happens to be a farmer, mm -hmm. and we talked a lot about dignity and how this bring back, you know, that sense of purpose to coffee farmers and in this case, like female producers. But honest work, a job that pays well that gives you a living income that allows you as a human being to pay for your needs, either medicine, school, food, that gives you dignity. Uh, it's not that I can come with dignity and give it to you. It comes um, yeah. with, with your work, with the impact you have in your community. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of complex to say it, but there are many ways again, that you can allow people to have their, have dignity and their yeah. own way. So yeah. it's, yes. we, we came to that conclusion. It was like work, like working with coffee and making it, making it sustainable, he said, gives me dignity. I love that. I love that. And dignity that is well-deserved because for folks who sit behind a desk and um, not um, engage themselves with all the elements that can change in a moment's notice that it requires to grow coffee. You know, you know, we can't even start to have the appreciation that we should. We just can't. You know, I grew up on a farm and I know how hard that life is. And for me, my whole intentions in life were to get away from that because it was hard work. There's nothing easy about being on a farm or living on a farm or farming. There's nothing easy about it. Um, so, but there's a, it's a certain kind of person who will do that and who will find joy. And, and if they can find dignity and gain, maintain that from a market, it says a lot. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy to know that you're having those conversations with your dad because he's growing from you and you're growing from his wisdom. Um, we're having different conversations and difficult conversations yeah. as well. Maybe uh, it's not always talking about or share, um, but uh, we're moving towards an industry, at least from, from my perspective, when a female, you know, the next generation, female producers, um, are changing the way that their fathers or the coffee growers saw the industry and understanding just maybe having like a lead role or knowing that women that come from a coffee producing family or coffee communities can have other roles in the industry. Um, yeah. It will be different 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the change. I can see it as well. Um, I remember talking to uh, some of the producers in Africa about taking control of their own narrative. You know, telling them, I love telling your story, but you should be the one that owns your story. You're the one that you, you live it. I can't possibly tell someone else's story as well as they can tell their own story or share their own story. And I'm starting to see that happen. And um, I really like that. I was at a major retailer over the weekend and I bought some coffee and it was from a place in Cameroon. And I went online and the farm had their own website. It wasn't through a US trading or roasting company. And it was just a great story about them. And I thought this is what we need, not to necessarily cut people out of the chain, but if the story is about them, you should tell your story yeah. because you can better tell your story than anyone else. So exactly. it, it's taken a long time, but it's, but it's happening. I think technology has been fundamental uh, yeah. to, to do that. And then now 
uh, language, you know, but even now technology allows you to translate. So you can write in Spanish and Chinese and yes. in any other language and you'll have an idea, maybe not the correct translation, but you'll get what the farmers or uh, other coffee professionals in other side of the world are trying to share. So and it's about community. It's about not feeling isolated and trying to make better decisions. So, and being inspired by others from around the world, you know, that has a huge impact on how we grow in the industry. I see, I, I speak from experience, but I see more women also doing it, like that are my age, or not necessarily my age, yeah. but there is this need or interest in seeking more knowledge. Yes. Um, and just learning, learning from others, like learning from, from your work. I wanted to ask Felix, last year, kind of moving a bit, uh, last year you sent a powerful and inspiring mm. letter to, to the coffee industry. Uh, one that was a wake up call to everyone amidst crazy, crazy times that really challenged not, all, not only our business model, but also our model compass, our way of looking at life, and how we can handle difficult situations in crisis, how we work with farmers and how we show a product, right? So it, it was like um, challenging in all ways. So since you sent that letter to the coffee industry, how has, have you seen a notable change? Uh, what, what happened after you um, share those words with, with the coffee industry, because I think it was just, it was perfect timing. Yeah, you know, last year, um, I wrote the open letter to the US coffee industry on racism. And that letter kind of came from a place of being one of very few black women in coffee and um, understanding it um, at this level, you know, beyond the retail part of it. Um, just being one of few and always asking myself, you know, why is it this way in the U.S., you know, and it can be very confusing because coffee is a global product. So when you go to conferences, you see an array of people. But what I think we don't realize is that we're still not as inclusive as we could be. And the disadvantage to that is we miss out on opportunities and ideas and new ways of thinking and new solutions. Um, and so I've just been blessed to have so many different opportunities to, to serve in the industry, to see different things. Um, and I just saw fewer women and I saw fewer black people, I saw fewer people of color in those positions. And I felt like we should try to change that. And I always thought that, you know, large corporations, they're the ones, they're the ones with the dollars, they can, you know, implement some program and change the face of, you know, change consumption habits, if nothing else. But that's only a blip. That's only, okay, if you put these dollars in and market to this group of people, more will consume coffee. But what will that really do for really building inclusion and building a more robust industry? You know, the U.S. is at a point to where our coffee consumption growth numbers have, have been pretty much stable for the last few years. We, we consume coffee at a high level, but, you know, they've been pretty flat at you know, which is good, probably jumped up a little bit, you know, even if the numbers don't show during the pandemic. But I, I felt like there was a lost opportunity within the Black community, a lost opportunity in employment, participation, and consumption. Just when I looked around, when I, when I went on uh, missions or trips with other uh, coffee professionals, I was the only black person. Even if I'm going to Africa, Latin America, I'm the only black person. Yeah. You know, if I'm sitting in a room, you know, coffee professionals, 
I'm the only black person. If I'm in a boardroom, if I'm, it's just a rare instance where you're like, oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, you know, there's another that. one. Yeah. There's, you know how that is. There's another one over there. And so I think being someone who carry both the identity as a woman and as a black person, um, those are the things that stood out to me. Um, and we talked earlier about my strong alignment with women and fighting for gender equity. Um, my fight wasn't with black women. It, my fight wasn't for black women in coffee. I, I wanna make that clear. It was with women in coffee because had I chosen the route to, to advocate or for black women in coffee, I literally would have been by myself. 20 years ago, it would have been just me. So it was the women in coffee gave me friendships. It gave me a team to fight with. Over the last few years, we've started to see a surge, a surge of Black individuals becoming more engaged in coffee. And for whatever reason, I think it could be because the barrier to entry is lower. You know, you don't have to be traveling all over the world. You can't anymore to find the best coffees. Um, so I think that there's opportunities that have presented itself so such that technology has helped to level the playing field. But there truly is a need to engage more, to be more inclusive, to have the voices of individuals. And oftentimes we kind of think, oh, I don't quite know how that translates out into my country. It kind of does. It translates into every country. It really does. Oppression doesn't stop at the US borders. Oppression and racism and systemic racism does not stop at the US borders. I wish it did, but it does not. You know, when I was in El Salvador, I remember asking the most uncomfortable question to my host, why is it the pickers, your workers don't look like you? And he had the most uncomfortable time explaining to me that they were more Mayan and he was more European. And in that moment, I knew that it was the same as if, you know, my black family working in the cotton fields, you know, with the white owners driving by in the truck. So it does not, if you open your eyes to see racism and oppression and systemic racism, it is everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I highly agree with you. And after you, you sent that letter and also we, last year it was very, let's look at ourselves because yeah. um, we, at least speaking from a Latin American stand, standpoint or maybe Nicaraguan specifically, uh, sometimes we, we think of ourselves as very diverse because we are in a sense diverse, right? Uh, we were colonized and, and, and everything. That's kind of the general idea. But when we look at systemic racism, uh, we really don't acknowledge that we have a problem with racism. So just starting from there, you know, not, not acknowledging that we have a problem, it's a problem. I think that's one of the biggest issues that we think we're diverse, but we're not seeing the the bigger picture and also it's good that you say you know that racism goes beyond just the united states because it's it's everywhere yes it's, yes. it's everywhere and maybe has a different shade right but it's still the same and it's it's a lot of it still exists we try to operate or think that we operate differently, but it takes a long time for things to change. It really does. Um, you know, I sit in my office and I have my grandparents' picture on my wall and they were born in, in the late 1800s. And I think about, you know, they were farmers and they probably could not ever imagine uh, their granddaughter or woman um, being in a position of power, not just within the black community, but on a global level. So, so we do advance. We advance as much as we like to get frustrated and think that 
nothing ever changes, especially, you know, as women. Um, but things do change. They do. I think it's also like, since we live in a, maybe in an age or world that wants everything to happen fast, um, we, yeah, we can get also overwhelmed by not seeing the, the changes maybe within six months or a year. But when, like you said, we look back, we have come a long way. From my perspective, you know, it, um, I've seen a lot of, I follow and I see a lot of women, Black women that are doing great things in the United States or mm -hmm. just people that work as a barista or a roaster or just, you know, have a podcast, uh, occupying more spaces uh, mm -hmm. and creating those those spaces yes. maybe they so there wasn't one so let's mm -hmm. build one let's create this community so that is very inspiring yes. because um we can we can continue learning you know from from this side maybe i say latin america but we can continue learning from the great things that other folks are doing in the united yes. states yes and i see a lot of great things coming out of latin america as well you know, especially with the women, you know, just doing some remarkable things, finding their place. And uh, for many Latin American countries, you know, you have the value in producing the coffee, starting to consume the coffee. We don't produce a lot of coffee here. So there's this element that we're, we're not as, as informed as you are, you know, to be honest. Um, so there's some unique opportunities that you have. And so I'm, I'm happy to know that uh, you're inspired by us, but we're also inspired by you um, and to see what women are doing, because it is a progression. Um, as you said, we want things to happen quickly. I've always looked at my life as there's a moment in this chain that belongs to me and the work that I can do. And I wanna help advance it. That's all I can do. I can't complete it. It's too much to complete. I can't, I don't wanna push it back, right? I want to help advance it. And I think that if we look at our lives and our work in that way, we don't feel this, this sense of urgency that's not going to happen anyway, right? Yeah. Things will only happen. I talked about race and coffee well before 2020, wow. well before 2020, and few listened. Every now and then, there's a moment in time. And if we're lucky, we're alive during that moment in time when the issues that we care about, others are willing to listen. So that when that moment in time opens for you, and you step into it, there's good work. There's even more work that can be done. So I think that that has happened for both gender and racial equity, for equity in general. Um, I think it has happened. I see it, you know, uh, what, you, what you are saying as building the foundations yes. for others to build and or yes. continue advancing. Yeah, we keep working towards a better industry. That's all we can do is work towards, there are some things we're doing we know we should not be doing, right? But there are some things that will take time. I think we think too much of ourselves when we think that we can come on the scene and solve all the problems and not see ourselves as an element of change in that segment, right? Because we're not going to solve all the problems. Challenges will come even with those solutions. So it's almost like a not just as you start to unravel it tightens. So, you know, when I was working with the women in coffee and, and I thought, okay, now women have money, but there's a challenge with that. What's going on in other? So there's this constant need to examine. I, I, I can apply that, you know, to a project we did in El Salvador that it's uh, kind of improving infrastructure for a farmer and we were like oh well you know she will have a better drying site a better more capacity but that means also hiring someone else that means changing the workflow that yeah. means adapting a new way of working um and like what do we do like what trainings do we have how can we support and then 
oh, okay, this farmer has become very efficient in doing this, but what's the next step? It, it's the same, you know, when we want to change something in terms of uh, racism, gender equality, more inclusion. Um, when we get there, what are the next steps? Right, right. And we'll make mistakes. You know, that's the thing. You'll make mistakes. And yeah, I'm. as I look back, the one thing I never want to do is say, you know, we should have done more. Because if I've done all that I could do, you know, with the resources that I have, you can always do more. But when you've done your best, that's all that's required. And so yeah. I feel like that I've lived a life um, in the industry where I have spoken up, where I have um, put my resources in the spaces that I truly believed in, that I've invested in the things that I care about. And that's what's important. That's what makes you feel joyful um, about your work. Uh, and that really comes from, from understanding just and from my perspective, not just, you know, what do I do in this role, but how this has the power to impact others yes. um, at a greater scale, even if I'm not seeing it. Exactly. You can't quantify it. You cannot figure out the impact of the work that you're doing. Just, just do it, right? Just do it. I know that you, that one of the things that came after uh, the open letter and also kind of like black the black community coming together in the United States was um, creating the Coffee Coalition for for racial equity. Um, maybe can you expand on on your current work there? Um, what are some of the initiatives that you are doing, and how can we as an industry learn more about this work? Sure. Um, well, the CCRE, the Coffee Coalition for Racial Equity, um, you know, it's been an incredible year. Uh, it's been inc an incredible year because um, all of those in the industry who have reached out saying, how can we be a part of this? And before the CCRE was established, the thing that I wanted to see happen in the industry I wanted us to move beyond the window dressing of inclusion, talking about it, writing about it, photographing it, you know, all of that. I wanted it to mean something. Um, and I had the life experiences to know that it could mean something. It could be a really solid and in-depth uh, career and understanding of coffee, passionate co um, coffee understanding and knowledge relationships. So. The CCRE, we are a board of 16 individuals. We are just a group of individuals that range from one extreme to the other in the industry. And um, I wanted the board to not be all of one people, because oftentimes we think if we're going to fix this problem, if we're going to fix gender problems, we're just going to get a bunch of women together to get it done. And as much as I really know that women can get it done, you still need men in the room. You need gender equity. You need diversity and inclusion in that room. And so our board is filled with individuals from so many different backgrounds. Uh, we represent six different countries. Um, wow. I think our, um, we kind of quantified how many different languages. I, I think it was up to 13 different languages um, the board members speak collectively. Um, I've been in so many rooms where there wasn't diversity. And I have to say, having that much diversity in the room, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. But if you figure out how to get everybody on the same accord and be accepting of what we're all bringing to the table, some really, really good work is, is being done. And I'm proud of the work that we've been able to do in a pandemic, you know, with everything that is going on, um, we, a couple months ago, we launched the NKG PACE program. It's a partnership with Norman Cafe Group, um, German-based trading company, Green Coffee Logistics and Trading Company. Um, this company has been around for well over 100 years, you know, 
and to learn the ins and outs of the green coffee trade, to work in their offices. Um, they're employing three Black Americans to work in their offices throughout the U.S. for one year, so one year paid internship. So it's like getting a, a, a degree in coffee, but you get to actually work in a, in a space where it all comes together. I mean, you work in the green coffee trade, so you can only imagine what something like this would have been like for, for myself 20 years ago to have that insight, um, you know. So I'm, I'm very pleased by that. I'm pleased by the, uh, the Doña Ivone scholarship. Doña Ivone is um, a Black Brazilian woman who worked for 65 years at wow. the world's oldest research institute in Campinas, Brazil. Um, she went from picking coffee cherries to working in the laboratory. And so we named a scholarship in her honor. And Torani is our, our primary sponsor for that scholarship. We will be announcing um, the actual program starting in October. Um, and we're looking for um, Black individuals who want to advance their education and knowledge in coffee because, you know, that's how you advance is by knowing more and um, becoming more educated. So we're building that program out. Um, there's a lot going on and we are just excited to have the engagement at the table. Um, how can how can people maybe apply? Like where they can, can they go if they want to learn more about um, the, you know, these opportunities to, to yeah. advance and, and grow? Yeah, yeah. Go to the coffeeforequity.com, coffeeforequity.org website or um, nkgpace.com. Um, those are two, there's an application process and with the application, we ask for a reference. So just ask someone to write a, a, a nice reference for you. And um, yeah, it's, it's almost like an opportunity that's too good to be true, to be honest. Um, and I'm excited to see the program grow. So go to our website. You'll be able to see, follow us on social media, um, Coffee for Equity. Um, so it's, a lot is always happening. It's just such a dynamic group of individuals. Um, we're always working on things that we feel should matter. Um, and it seems new and fresh, um, but it's just because we've never had a space. We've never created a space. And once we start to give in to coffee and allow all of us to see it through our own eyes and how we interact with it, there's some room in it for all of us. And there's opportunity for us to grow. Like, you know, you mentioned you were inspired by the things that you're seeing. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, education, really, no one can take it away from you. Um, so that's how you can also build, you know, a better, a better industry. It's so common for us to think that if we focus on one group of people, then others are left out. But that's, that's not true. And I know you understand this. <laughs> uh, it it's kind of what equity feels like though. And that feeling of equity doesn't always feel good. It feels excluded. Um, but I can tell you as a minority owned business for the last 20 years, the opportunities that I've gotten, I've engaged with non-black businesses to deliver to customers in the way that we needed to. And those have been partnerships. And that's business that have that has grown those companies. So what appears to feel uncomfortable and exclusion, it really isn't. It, it really, really isn't. Um, and understand that when we're when we all have a seat at the table and we're all giving, then we all receive. So the idea of um, your education. I wonder, did your parents share that with you? Is that something your parents told you? Yeah, well, I, I come from a family where education really mattered, like where education mm -hmm. was seen as a way to 
uh, advance in life, um, that it was good to learn, to read, to just be curious. And that as a woman, if I wanted to um, kind of grow, you know, and, and become like a, you know, have the a, opportunity to travel, just learn or do something uh, beyond my town, I needed to uh, focus on my education. Mm -hmm. And, but that had to be something that I wanted to do. Um, not just because it's good or because it's the only way, uh, but really like have it inside me. So I learned that from my family and, and that's why education also, it's, it's so important and not just like proper education, formal education, there are many types and ways of learning. And, and, and that has allowed me to realize that no one can take that from you. Mm -hmm. and that is yeah. what helps you grow. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely something I heard as a child growing up, um, get your education and something that is, I will, you know, safely say that is very common in the black community is get your education because no one can take that away from you. You can be stripped of a lot of things in life, but no one can take your education and you can always use that to better yourself. So we really see education, but we don't necessarily see it from the perspective that people need to be more educated, that way they experience racism less. We understand yeah. that there's, you know, there's a need to uh, educate individuals who don't understand racism, you know, uh, individuals who can be our allies, you know, not just black people, but, and, and that's why we have a diverse group of people at the table um, to try to advance this cause. Um, and so I'm excited that we get to work um, in this space at this time, you know, on this Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Life is interesting. It is very interesting. And we have a lot to learn about ourselves, a, a lot to untangle. Um, but the more, the more you, we put ourselves in a situation where we challenge ourselves. That's when there's growth. Yeah, right? totally. Speaking about putting ourselves in a maybe not comfortable situation or a challenging situation that allows you to grow or change. How do you believe or how do you think that copy companies can continue supporting the next generation of women or the next generation of youth? Yeah. Or the next generation of copy professionals in, in the copy industry? Yeah. Where can the companies start? Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. And I believe that we are at a point where we have to kind of sit aside um, this whole idea of what we believe works because we're like hopefully soon on the other side of a pandemic and we're different people in a way, you know, we've experienced things that we've never experienced before, only things we've read about. We've lost loved ones. And I, I believe that we have stepped into a moment in time where we really are going to have to put aside some of the more traditional, and when I say traditional, I mean more male sort of dominated, ran types of companies and operations. Um, because for us, life matters even more now. We've seen, you know, death and destruction and, you know, it seems to be happening constantly around us. Um, there is no greater time than to have women in decision-making roles. There is no greater time than to have people who are compassionate for other people in decision-making roles because we, we're in a world right now, we're in a space where so much compassion is needed. Everywhere you look, there's a need for compassion from corner to corner, you know, just saddened by everything that's happening. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional by it, but we've always needed that. We've just not done it. We've, we've believed that um, profit and pushing forth and productivity and, you know, holding everybody accountable to at the same rate as if nothing is going on. 
that capitalistic sort of society and way of thinking, I don't think we as humans are going to stand for that going forward. And I think that people who are trapped in that are trying to find ways out of it, to have a life of dignity, you know, like yeah. your dad was talking yeah. about, a life of just simple dignity. Exactly. It's not always about the flow charts and the Gantt charts and the, you know, who's doing this. Those are the things that drive us crazy, right? It's about living life and knowing that our work has contributed in a positive way to others. And for us to feel assured in that way and for us to feel authentic in our work and being free to do our work. And I feel that that women somehow, and, and not just women, but anyone that has not had the primary opportunity to not be thought to be given, okay, well, we know you got the answer. You know, you fit the description of a person who typically will have the answer. I think anyone who has been counted out, be it black people, be it women, um, they've pushed a little harder. They've operated in an environment where they've been not, thought to have the solutions and their style has been discounted. Their style of leadership, right? Um, or work it, as twice, as, you know, work twice to, yes. to get this, uh, yes. go not one mile, two miles, three miles yes. beyond yes. To, to achieve this and to be like at the same level. Yes, yeah. So I think companies have to, they have to stop and think about the future of the workforce and to understand that women innately have the skills to help lead. They don't have to be at the, the bottom of the, the barrel. They don't have to, yeah, they don't have to be doing the, the menial work. Um, they should be in the decision-making roles. They should be given the opportunities. They should have the opportunities as everyone else. These are the times are changing, and, and um, I see it from from my understanding like a more holistic approach um, yeah. of how do we comply or how we achieve this with with our own means and our people and and the area we are either you know sourcing coffee, roasting it, selling it or just serving the coffee. Yeah. Um, it applies to, uh, to all the parts in the supply chain. Yes, yes. So it is hopeful. I mean, I'm hope is all I got. So I am very hopeful about the future. I think we as humans will always evolve um, and understand what's better as we progress. But yeah, it's it's great to have this conversation with you. I know when we did our prep call, I, I was left with thinking, wow, she's she's an amazing young woman and a great example of the future, for, especially from the producing end. And to have the knowledge, the heart, the passion is just incredible. It's incredible to see you in the role that you're in. So. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor for me to have the opportunity to, to speak with you, to watch this. And like you said, um, to have hope because uh, there is hope, you know, not yeah. everything it's maybe the world is burning down, but there is some hope and we can be the change makers yeah. from where we are. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you very much for, for your time, Felix. It has been a pleasure um, to, to have this talk with you. Yes, thank you as well, Anna Sophia and Caravella Coffee. Thank you for having me. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned. The next episode will be a special as it will be in Spanish. A terrific opportunity to dust off your Spanish listening skills. But no worries. There will be English subtitles in our YouTube version. And if you have missed any of our earlier episodes, they're all available on Spotify, Google, and Apple Podcasts, as well as our YouTube channel. See you next week.